as you know, we're in a series called um, Exceedingly, Abundantly, and Eternally, because that's what the Lord has done for us. He does things for us exceedingly, which is, could be grace. He does things for us abundantly. I mean, nobody has lacked here. Nobody is wearing the same clothes from 10 years ago. He does things abundantly. And most importantly, he does things eternally, eternally by giving us his son. And this morning, I just want to share really quick. I don't even know how this is going to come out because it's been so, um, um, it's been so, um, I believe that the Lord wanted us to review the events of the resurrection. Sometimes we wait till Palm Sunday, and one of my friends, um, his church a few years ago, they did this crazy thing that the, this crazy thing that I would never put y'all through. But their church had a Black Friday service. And if, if I remember correctly, they had the people come and they had the no worship. They had, some of you are already like, oh no, I wouldn't even go. There's no worship. Jacob's not gonna sing, I'm not gonna be there. But they didn't have worship. They didn't even have like music playing. And they had, uh, the sanctuary was pretty dark and and this is like the worst part of it. They turned off all the AC. So it was dark, no worship, no music, and hot. And it was in Texas, so you can imagine. And it was really just to help them, put them in the moment of what Christ went through. And I believe that for the month of March, we wait, we almost wait till Easter to talk about what God, what what Jesus went through, the suffering that he that he um, went through for us. But I believe that the Lord wants us to talk about the essentials starting today, the essentials of the resurrection or the resurrection essentials. And I had never really. Um, I don't know if you guys um, had ever heard the word essential so much as we did during the pandemic. I mean, it was the essentials. The essentials were toilet paper, water, what else? Lysol, hand sanitizer, everything that was not on the shelves anymore was an essential and we were we were like asking our neighbors for it or or buying extra and then and then it was limited like remember when you could only buy two packs of toilet paper i mean and now now it's like i don't know if you guys still stock up i think i had toilet paper for like a year and a half <laughs> i don't know how i did that but it's the truth and so the, the resurrection essentials, what would be, what was needed for the resurrection? Obviously, the nails. Obviously, a crown of thorns. Obviously, a whip was needed and a robe and the cross and the tomb. And for there to be a tomb, there had to be a stone. Those were the essentials. Did Jesus provide his own essentials? Did he provide his own nails? Did he say, here's the crown I want to wear? Did he say, here's the whip that's going to torture me to bring healing? Here's the robe, here's the outfit I want to wear for this presentation. 
No. Just as God provides for the birds of the air, he provided all the essentials for the resurrection, for the crucifixion and the resurrection. And these nails, um, today we're going to talk about the nails. And these are little nails, actually. Um, but they still look very painful. If I put this through your hand, Jesse, would you still love me? <laughs> You're not sure. <laughs> How about you, Debbie? if I put this through your foot. Yeah, these are little, but they're still very painful. But we needed, Christ needed the nails to be hung on the cross. The nails represent, the, uh, the nails were, we needed he, the nails to be pierced so Christ could be pierced for our sins for our rebellion. The crown of thorns was given by the Roman soldiers and, and pressed on Jesus' head. Um, the title, the, the, thorn, the, the crown of thorns represents um, identity. Identity, because they mocked him. When they put the crown on and pressed it in, the soldiers mocked Jesus and said, King of the Jews, save the people would pass and say, Save yourself now. Who are you? You call yourself the Son of God. Deliver yourself. So the crown represents identity. And the whip was, represents our healing without the whip. Without, the whip was what um, caused the stripes, the stripes of our healing. The stripes, the, 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 stripes, the, the, the torture that he took. Man, I, well, since I'm going to do the whip another Sunday, I'm going to have one up here. But what they say is that the whip was actually had, was covered with nails. And so whenever the soldiers whipped Jesus, as Pilate had them do, it, when, it would, when it would hit his back, it would tear flesh off of him. So the, the, the Jesus we see in movies is a pretty one. The real Jesus really had no, the Jesus that was tortured for you and I had no skin. And the robe represents royalty, royalty. But today I want to talk about the nails, <clears throat> and I'm not going to take much time here. There's a beautiful scripture in, in the Bible that practically the whole world can recite, can quote, and hopefully everybody knows it here, and it's John 3, 16, and it says, for this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So he gave he gave us his son. However, um, the beautiful thing about this scripture is that the person that, um, that, the person that said this scripture is Jesus himself. Um, and he knew the heavenly father. He could say that because he knew the heavenly father. He knew he was the only son of God. He knew, and he knew how much I can imagine Jesus hearing the Father's cry, seeing the Father's um, tears for the world, 
that he, and the word doesn't say that Jesus was like, hey, I'll go. No, the father said, you'll go. I'm going to give the world you, my only son. And so the other day, um, Sam, uh, this week, Sam spoke again. And on Monday, um, he, him and I met for dinner. And um, I'm going to take some of this scripture, but because I know the Lord wanted me to speak on John 3.16, what Sam, um, the Lord told me, I want you to go to the top of the chapter. And Sam had started to share with me some things about church, but he happened to name this man. His name is Nicodemus. And he is at the top of the chapter. He is at the top of John 3. John 3, 16 is so beautiful. But 1 through 15 is the explanation of why God um, sent his son. And it says in John 3, 1, it starts off and it says, I'm reading the message because um, normally I don't read the message, but it's so, so powerful this morning. And it says, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader who was a Pharisee. And after dark one evening, after dark one evening, evening he came to speak to Jesus. Now here we have a Pharisee. He is also a leader of the Pharisees. And Sam said, yet he came when it was dark. And sometimes we come to Jesus when it's dark, in our dark moments. We don't always come when it's a beautiful worship service. But Nicodemus had questions that he didn't want his Pharisee colleagues to hear him asking or looking for Jesus. So the word of God says that he came looking for Jesus when it was dark at night. And he said, Rabbi, we all know you're a teacher straight from God. And no one, no one could do all God-pointing, God-revealing acts you do if God weren't in it. In other words, he recognized you're doing amazing things. You've already turned the water into wine. You're leading people. You're delivering people. There's no way. He knew. Nicodemus knew the law. He knew the, the, the scripture. He knew the prophecies. He knew who Jesus was. And he said, there's no way you can do that if God wasn't in it. And some of you know, some of you know, there's no way I could have made it home this morning if God wasn't in that. There's no way I could have gotten that position at work if God wasn't in that. There's no way my husband would have whatever if God wasn't working through him. There's no way. But there's still that dark moment. By the way, the title of my message is um, Nailed for Life. Nailed for Life. And yet Jesus answered, Jesus said, you're absolutely right, Nicodemus. Take it from me. Unless a person is born from above, it's not possible to see, to see what I'm pointing to. I'm pointing to God's kingdom. How can anyone, said Nicodemus, he still had questions. He said, how can anyone, Lord, be born who has already been born and grown up? In other words, how can someone be reborn into their mother's womb? That's what Nicodemus thought Jesus meant. And he said, you can't, can't re-enter your mother's womb and be born again. What are you saying to this born from above talk? And Jesus said, you're not listening. You're not listening. Listen, Linda. I just had to say that. Let me say it again. 
unless a person submits, this is what Jesus meant, unless a person submits to this original creation, the wind hovering over the water creation, the invisible move, move, the invisible, the invisible, this is so powerful, the invisible moving the visible, a baptism into a new life. It's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Jesus said, when you look at a baby, it's just that. A baby you can look at and touch. But Jesus said, but the person who takes shape within its form by something that you can't touch, that you can't see, the spirit, and be, it becomes a living spirit. So Jesus said, don't be surprised. Don't be so surprised when I tell you that you have been born from above, out of this world, so to speak. And he says, you will know well enough to, you, you know well enough how the wind blows this way and that way and you hear it rustling through the trees but you have no idea where it comes from or where it's headed next that's jesus says that's the way it is with everyone born from above by the wind of god by the spirit of god and nicodemus asked again why, what do you mean by this? How does this happen? And Jesus said, you have respect, you ha you're a respected teacher of Israel and you don't know these basics? Listen carefully. I'm speaking sober tru truth to you. I speak only of what you know by experience and I give witness only to what I have seen with my own eyes. Yet there's no, there, there is nothing secondhand here, no hearsay, Jesus said. Yet instead of facing the, the evidence and accepting it, you procrastinate with questions. See, sometimes we know, we know what the Lord is doing, we know that he moves in the spirit, and yet we're procrastinating what he wants us to do. We're procrastinating in our faith, in our belief, because we're asking the questions. We're so busy asking the questions. Why, mom, why do I have to clean my room? <laughs> but why? But why should I have put gas last night? But why we're so busy? I don't know if anybody here has the children that ask the whys and then the more whys. <laughs> I see Edward's hand back there. Are we talking about your kids or your wife? <laughs> Both. <laughs> we're so busy asking the questions and yet, like Jesus tells Nicodemus, man, you know the word, you know the, pr the prophecies, and yet you're, d you're wasting time. You're wasting time. And then he said, instead of facing the evidence and accepting it, you're, you're asking so many questions, you're delaying everything, Nicodemus. And he says, if I tell you the things that are plain as the hand before your face and you don't believe me, what use is there in telling you these things that you can't even see? The things of God. No one has ever gone into the presence of God, Jesus says, except the one who came down from that presence, the Son of Man. And... The nails, these nails, why do I speak on this? Because Jesus was simply trying to tell him that what, if I explain to you what you can't see, you're wasting time with what, why should I even tell you if you already know? He says, in the same way that Moses had, uh, lifted up the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. 
and everyone who looks upon up to him, trusting and expecting, trusting everyone that looks to him, Jesus said, will have uh, trusting and expectant will gain a, a real life, an eternal life. It is what we believe in that Jesus, it is what we believe that he did for us. And then he says, Jesus says, this is how much God loved the world. He loved more. He just didn't sit on his throne and say, oh man, they're going to perish. No, the word of God says, this is how much God loved the world that he gave his son. He had a plan, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed by believing in him. All we have to do is believe in him. Nicodemus, just believe. Listen, Nicodemus. Stop with the questions. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. And it says God didn't go into all the trouble to send, Jesus is saying he didn't go into all this trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger. He didn't send his son so that Jesus could... Um, point his finger at us. That's what the Pharisees did. Telling the world how bad it was, he came to help. How many of you have found a helper in Jesus? The word of God says that he came to help and to put the world right again. The world does not seem right right now, but it is right. He gave us, he made us righteous through him. And then the word of God says, he came to help, he came to put, make the world right again. Anyone who trusts, this is just this simple, anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. I don't know if anyone needs to be acquitted. I don't know if anyone needs to be set free this morning. I don't know if anyone feels bound and needs a breakthrough. But the word Jesus says right here, if you would just Trust in me. It says anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under death sentence without even knowing it. How painful is that? That be, simply because I didn't, when we don't trust him and I don't trust him, what I'm doing is I'm living, I'm living, I'm living a death sentence. And why, Jesus says, because of that person's failure to believe in the one of a kind, son of God, when introduced to him. It wasn't the nails <clears throat> back to God giving us his one and only son. He gave us his son right here. When we think of that scripture, I hope that you think of what he did for us, the reason that he came. Not just he gave us his son, the baby that we talk about in the manger. No, the son, the, the man that came to save us. This is what he gave us right here. This is how he came into the world as a, as a baby. And he was also... Um, they also tried to kill Jesus as a baby. But this was his purpose right here. It wasn't the nails that kept Jesus on the cross. It was his love for you and me that kept him on that cross. Because he could have called on the angels to deliver him. He could have, but his, the nails are what kept Jesus on the cross. For you, it was his love for you and for me. And what kept him on the cross? This is a hard one. <laughs> his obedience to the Father. His obedience to the Father. And many times we want the will of God, but the will of God calls for obedience to the Father. We want to do what the Lord 
has for us, but it takes obedience. It takes being submitted. It takes knowing the Father's heart and the Father's will. Can I have those? Um, so <clears throat> let's take a look at something a little more real. So the definition of nails or nails I mean, we use nails to hang pictures, to build, but you never really see the nails. They're just like the support system. Um, unless like you're a really bad, <laughs> I was gonna say husband, but unless you're just, <laughs> you're really bad and you hang pictures like with a, a string and you see the string and the nail. Watch it. Watch it. <laughs> Don't do that. Hide the nail. Um, so the nail, the nails, they support. And, um, but to nail down is to make final. Like, don't you just love it when you hammer the head on the nail and you just it just like it's smooth on whatever the wood or I mean the worst is getting like a nail in your tire and it's just smooth <laughs> that's not the, what we're talking about today but to nail down is to make final and the what Jesus did he said when when it when he was hung on the cross, and he went through the whole death scenario, his final words were, it is finished. In other words, it's final. It's final. The nails, they represent, can you see, let me see that one, Debbie. We, we don't know, I don't know if this if they, if they were bigger than this. But all of a sudden, Jesse, would you rather have this one? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and just, just compare that. They had to be nails, they say they were anywhere from six to 10 inches to hold the hands. And some people say it was the wrist, but actually, um, I did some studying, and it was actually like right here at the thumb, because right here it wouldn't have, it would have ruptured veins, and he couldn't die from the piercing. He could, he wasn't, according to the prophecy, he couldn't, he couldn't die from hanging on the cross, because then when he was, when his feet were also pierced, um, his feet were, they say there was a little um, piece of wood that helped him, but he had been tortured so much, so he, he, he had to keep lifting himself to be able to breathe. Um. <clears throat> and so when he was nailed, and when he said his final words, it is finished, he meant it was accomplished perfectly. He's telling the Father, your will, your plan has been accomplished perfectly. Perfectly. Jesus nailed our sins to that cross. He needed this. This was an essential to nail my sins, your sins, to that cross. And when he said it was finished, he accomplished the Father's will perfectly. Church, be grateful for this. Yes, our Lord suffered. He had to suffer. 
It was the, the prophecy in Isaiah 53. If you go back and read that, it's the details of the nails. It's the details of the torture. Not so much, what, not so much the essentials, but it was, it's the details of the torture. And these things cause a lot of pain. These, these things cause a lot of pain. The crown of thorns is where the enemy tries to steal your identity. And in a few Sundays, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak on that as well. But <clears throat> he went exceedingly. We want to say exceedingly blessed, abundantly blessed, eternally blessed. But what, what God is revealing to me is that he went, don't forget that he went exceedingly. The pain that he went through was exceedingly. The torture that he went through was abundantly. And the healing that you and I have, the salvation, the reconciliation back to the Father, the grace is the work of Calvary, the work of the gruesomeness of this cross so that we could be eternally with him. Why don't we stand? This morning, <clears throat> I don't, I think I, I, I take it for, I don't take it for granted, but being uh, new up here, sometimes I forget um, how important the prayer of salvation is and how important the prayer of not just salvation, but of reconciliation. Because just as this morning I felt a heaviness I'm reminded that sometimes we walk in here and we didn't, we didn't have a good week. We didn't, have, uh, we didn't come in here saying, I'm a child of God, I'm blessed and highly favored, I'm, um, I'm a princess. Do I sound like Joe Osteen yet? <laughs> no. I sometimes I forget that we come in here almost crawling, trying to make it to service. And this morning, I'm, remi I I'm reminded of a beautiful testimony I heard this uh, yesterday. There's a, someone that's been coming to this church, and I see them when I look out in the audience, and so peaceful, so calm, but I didn't know they had been going through some things. And um, it's been about a month that there, the fire has been like um, turned like on them. And as this person was sharing with me, uh, when Pastor Mario was here, he, he invited the church to the prayer of salvation. And in that moment, that person received the Lord. Mind you, I had been seeing them for years here. And she told me when he received the Lord that he felt that he could trust the Lord because he was here worshiping with us. But when he, when, we, when he received the Lord, and when he received Jesus as his Lord and Savior, what do we do when we call him Lord? We submit to his will. We lay pride down. And that's what he did. And he has felt this freedom that God is going to take care of his situation. So this morning, I just want to make that, 
invitation to anyone that needs to accept the Lord as their, that needs to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Let's, let's, let's call on his name. Be, then you can call him your Savior. Then you can call him your Lord. And then you can, if this, this could be your first time, this could be your second time, this could be your third time. I don't care if it's your hundredth time because we serve a God of grace. We serve a God of grace. So church, just repeat after me because we want to make, this is a family and we want to welcome those that have need the, need the Lord and need to come back to the Lord. So repeat after me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you that you loved us so much. You loved us abundantly, exceedingly, and eternally you love us. That you gave us your son to die on the cross. And today, I receive Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you receive the Lord, we welcome you. Come on, church. There's a party in heaven. We can have a party here, too. Let's worship. Let's worship. And if anyone.